The Devil's Tower, a great and majestic wonder with nothing like it for miles around. In 1875, Richard Irving Dodge gave it its current name. It was then immortalised by President Roosevelt, who designated it as the first United States National Monument. The Devil's Tower is made of igneous rock. The igneous in igneous rock is derived from the Latin word ignis meaning fire. It is magmatic rock. Volcanic eruptions of lava are the source of magma and the main source of igneous rocks. When the Devil's Tower cooled, it is theorised that as the magma cooled, hexagonal columns were formed up to 20 feet tall. It is acknowledged that the data scientists have found provides no actual explanation for exactly how the Devil's Tower was formed. They have put forward a few theories that are taught and widely accepted as fact, but in truth, how the Devil's Tower was formed to this day remains a mystery. It was not always called the Devil's Tower. The Native Americans called it Mateo Tepe or the Great Bear Lodge and there is entire folklore surrounding it. Basalt columns are geological structures made from hardened lava. They are a contraction of volcanic rock that hardens into a natural pillar as it cools. And so, just as our history is full of missing parts, different theories, anomalies and mysteries, so too do we find this in the world around us. In his book, The Fractal Nature of the Universe, Benoit Mandelbrot says that many forms in nature can be described mathematically using fractals. To simplify, he said, you can create a fractal by taking a smooth looking shape and breaking it into pieces over and over again. Repetition over and over again. This is what mathematicians describe as iteration and it is one of the keys to fractal geometry. A fractal is a never-ending pattern. Fractals are infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different scales. They are created by repeating a simple process over and over in an ongoing feedback loop. Driven by recursion, fractals are images of dynamic systems, the pictures of chaos. Geometrically, they exist in between our familiar dimensions. Fractal patterns are extremely familiar since nature is full of fractals. For instance, trees, rivers, coastlines, mountains, clouds, seashells, hurricanes. Abstract fractals, such as the Mandelbrot set, can be generated by computers, calculating simple equations over and over again. Our world is fractal, but there are principles to these pictures of chaos, such as the butterfly effect, this effect grants the power to cause a hurricane in China to a butterfly flapping its wings in New Mexico. It may take a very long time, but the connection is real. If the butterfly had not flapped its wings at just the right point in space-time, the hurricane would not have happened. A more rigorous way to express this is that small changes in the initial conditions lead to drastic changes in the results. Our lives are an ongoing demonstration of this principle. Who knows what the long-term effects of teaching millions of people about chaos and fractals will be. And who knows how the butterfly effect will affect your life. The Devil's Tower is a true wonder and a true anomaly, as basalt itself is a common mineral compound. However, to find it, in the long, thin pillars, almost perfect in their hexagonal shape. Some people think they could have practically been carved by hand. Biologists have found strangeness at the poles and an unnatural amount of ice and snow that shouldn't be there. There is an unnatural amount of carbon dioxide in the world's oceans as well. 
This abnormal concentration tells us about a worldwide fire in the past. Scientists have come to the conclusion that it wiped away with it 99% of the world's biosphere. 99% is a mind-boggling number and it means that everything that now grows, crawls, flies, swims and runs on the earth is 20,000 times less in volume than before this catastrophic fire. During the course of its life, the bumblebee will buzz to and fro, collecting nectar and pollen from the flowers. It can detect both the presence and the pattern of the electric field of the flowers. It does this to gather information on the flower and find out if it has recently been visited by another bee. Once they have collected enough nectar and pollen, they return to the nest and deposit this into wax cells. These wax cells are constructed into symmetrical hexagonal forms. The honeycomb is a mass of prismatic wax. The bees seem to have an almost innate intelligence that allows them to construct their honeycombs as hexagonal tiling because it creates equal sized cells while minimizing the total perimeter of the cells. Or in other words, it is economical, it uses the least material to create a lattice of cells. The geometric efficiency of the hexagon can be seen everywhere in nature. Located at the foot of Mount Parnassus was the Temple of Apollo and the Oracle of Delphi. The world famous Oracle of Delphi played a massive role in ancient history and it was consulted before every major battle and event and for 14 centuries it helped determine the entire course of empires. Sophocles, Alexander the Great and Croesus of Lydia all consulted the oracle at some time. It was constructed to honour the god Apollo and in some versions of Greek mythology it was a temple built by the Hyperboreans. In their mythology it was constructed by the Hyperboreans out of beeswax and wings. Before entering the temple incense was burnt and people would bathe to purify themselves before consulting the oracle. On the wall of the temple was written the immortal phrase, Know thyself. Before consulting the oracle, a sacrifice was made, usually of a lamb or of a calf. The oracle at Delphi was ancient Greece's most important priestess and soothsayer. She was known as a Pythoness, and she would enter into a psychoactive state and would practice divination. Shamanism, Paganism, Druidism from Europe, the Mediterranean, Gulf states all coalesced into a form of occult science and magical schools became popular in these islands. It is from these islands we also get the legend of Medusa. The priestess was called a Pythia and she sat above a chasm in the earth which belched forth fumes. She breathed deeply. Many believed that the fumes possessed hallucinogenic properties and she slipped into semi-consciousness began divination. Throughout cultures we come across creatures being turned to stone. The most famous of these legends is the legend of Medusa who had snakes in place of hair and whose glance would turn people to stone. These tales are found in European, Native American, Ancient Greek, Asian and Aborigine cultures. These stories often feature serpents or basilisks. Some researchers believe that these are our ancestors' ways of explaining petrification. Here are some images of petrified animals, and here are some of petrified wood from Petrified Forest Park in Arizona. Organic living matter petrifies in one of two ways. They become petrified in sediment like thick mud or in volcanic ash. When we look at the petrified trees, they haven't just turned to stone, they've turned to crystal. Current theories suggest that thick sediment or volcanic ash 
can turn living matter into crystal. The object needs to be impacted so the oxygen and bacteria cannot reach the matter and begin decomposing it. But perhaps this paradigm is incorrect. We bury our dead and they do not turn to stone or crystal. And as for the volcanic ash theory, volcanic eruptions produce volcanic ash, which is very destructive. As the Encyclopedia Britannica tells us, it can affect humans and animals' health in very detrimental ways. It can also destroy houses and disrupt electrical systems and aeroplanes. Yet, our current paradigm tells us that volcanic ash is responsible for wood petrification. Thousands have died at the hands of volcanic eruptions. Why do we not see petrified bodies of human crystal? Why do the victims decay? It isn't the lava. Lava would melt bone. As we saw with the bumblebee, the dragonfly's eyes are composed of the same hexagonal efficiency. And as we look around, the hexagon is everywhere in nature. No two snowflake patterns are the same, but they all share the same fundamental hexagonal geometry. When we look at tree rings under a microscope, we see similar geometric patterns of the hexagon. Microscopic photos of petrified wood show the same hexagonal columns. And then we have flax plant stems. As you can see, each individual fibre is hexagonal in shape. The natural world grows and develops with efficiency. The stem grows with hexagonal columns that allow it to grow upwards. And the result is this, beautiful plants and trees that grow upwards towards the sky. And the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland formed perfectly with its hexagonal shapes that mirror the tight efficiency we find in living matter. Silicon is the second most abundant element found in the Earth's crust after oxygen. Silicon is structurally very similar to carbon. Many scientists have theorised that silicon-based life is possible. When silicon interacts with oxygen, it turns into quartz. Was there a silicon era in which trees grew to enormous heights and were made primarily of crystal just like quartz? And what we call rocks today are really just fragments of old living trees and other silicon era organisms. Currently, it is theorised that columnar basalt was formed from cooling magma or lava flows. This is what lava looks like when it is active, and this is what it looks like when it is cooled and hardened. Here are some of the columnar basalt wonders in Iceland. Pan, magma and lava suddenly stop in mid-air forming perfectly hexagonal columns. Are rocks and stones the phase between silicon and carbon-based life forms? Our Earth is fractal. Were these columnar basalt columns once part of living trees? If we head back to the Devil's Tower in northwest Wyoming, we can see it is conical shaped and the top is flat. Was this once a gigantic silicon tree? Hexagonal pillars bend as they go into the ground, like the base of a tree. And if we look at the cracks in the columns, could they be petrified epidermis? And this a silicon tree, and this the bark of a carbon tree. Currently, it is believed that the high amounts of water and ice at the poles and the excess of carbon in our oceans is the result of the Industrial Revolution. But that does not explain all the carbon dating back thousands of years. 